Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Jen Birmingham. Jen is a managing director at Princeton University's investment management company, commonly known as Princo, one of the world's largest and most prestigious university endowments, where she has been leading efforts in finance and operations since 2010. Prior to Princo, Jen spent over eight years at Deutsche Bank Asset Management, where she was a managing director and global CFO of DB Advisors and Deutsche Insurance Asset Management. Jen and Princo are a prime example of how operations can provide leverage to an investment organization. For context on Princo's investment philosophy, longtime and retiring CIO Andy Golden is a repeat guest on Capital Allocators, and his first appearance is replayed in the feed. Jen and I discuss her transition to the endowment world from Wall Street and how Princo has evolved operationally since her arrival. We turn to the nuances of working at an endowment, collaboration across teams, and practical ways to drive adoption of new technology. We close by examining organizational challenges facing endowments today, along with operational advice for emerging managers. Please enjoy my conversation with Jen Birmingham. Jen, thanks for joining us. Tell me about how you got into the seat at Princeton. I was very lucky. I had come from Deutsche Asset Management, where I was there for about eight and a half years. I had started in what was called Global MIS, so global reporting for mostly financial management and information systems. I gradually worked my way up, and then there was a lot of transition with the CFOs within asset management. And I thought I was going to leave. I had a long chat with the global CEO. He said, don't leave. We can do something different. How about working in the hedge fund space and working with strategy? And so I said, yeah, that sounds great. Something different. So I went and worked in the hedge fund space. Pam Kiernan, who's at Two Sigma now, was my direct boss and ended up being a mentor for me in life. Had a great experience there. Was only there for a year-ish in that position when I was offered the CFO position of the Americas for asset management. And at the time we had... Americas from a legal entity perspective, you need a chief financial officer for that. But then we also had global product responsibilities, depending on management at the time, how they viewed the business, we had other responsibilities. And so that was the position I walked into. So I did that until 2010. And basically, that's when I had met this recruiter. And he had, through the years, talked about all of these banking roles. And I didn't leave Deutsche because I was unhappy. I loved the team I worked with. My boss was great. I had tons of responsibility. I learned a ton. Had become friendly with a recruiter who actually recruited people for my team at Deutsche. His name's Jeff. Came to me and he said, I've got something totally different. So we sat down and had a conversation about what it was. It was a new position created post-global financial crisis by a bunch of our peers Pranko was a new position and basically taking on the responsibilities of operations, finance, HR, legal, everything basically non-direct investment related. I spoke with him and then that was December 2009, met with the entire organization as well as people at the university over a course of a few months and started here in August of 2010. And what was appealing about that opportunity? I think it was... The entrepreneurial side of me, as well as this position in that it was a blank paper. Hey, this is unwritten. You're going to chart the course. And actually at Deutsche, it was the same thing. When I first joined them, they had just bought Scudder Investments and was starting the retail business in the U.S. That was intriguing to me. Something new, something that we could build. And so this had the same feeling of that 
but it incorporated a ton of my skills and experiences and put it into one role. I did accounting, I did a little finance, we did investing and did operations. So this brought it all together for me. What was it like coming from a Wall Street mentality to an Ivy League endowment? Very different in a good way, but it was also a tough transition. There's a lot of frenetic energy on Wall Street. And at the end of the day, you do have to pause, particularly if you're being introspective. And what am I working for? I had at the time three small children. And when I was working at Deutsche, I didn't see them much. That made you think, if I'm going to be spending all this time away from my family, I want it to be something very meaningful. And so that's why I vowed that I wasn't going to leave unless it was for something very different and something where I could actually do that. Being one of 10, education was huge in my family. My mom said, that's how doors are going to open for you. So make sure that becomes a key part of your life. Having the opportunity to use the skill sets I had gained over the years to do something for a mission, like a university like Princeton, you could not draft a better job spec. This ticked every single box for me. That was the main difference, but there are many, many other differences in terms of how we work. At Deutsche, it was, this is what we got to do, go get it done. Whereas when I came here, it was, whoa, let's talk about it. Let's be thoughtful about the paths we're going to take. Let's talk through those. Let's talk about the risks. What are the pros and cons? And let's talk about it a lot. I think we've grown a bit since I started, but in the beginning, it was every decision. And so that was very different for me to absorb and work because I was hired to do this blank sheet. I'm very excited. And Andy said to me, put the guns back in the holster. <laughs> Stop. Pause. <laughs> see how we work. And then take your experience and apply it. But first, figure out why we're quirky and how we're quirky and figure out how to make that better and don't just squash it. It was really important that I learned all of the cycles and the ebbs and flows of workflow, of decision making, and just how people work together. Deutsche is very much so about getting a lot of things done quickly and it was a mindset change for me that I had to make. What did the team look like at that point in 2010? So ops and tech were not built out yet. <laughs> so we had two folks in operations and we had two, I would call desktop support in tech. They were using a consultant to make sure things were functioning. Servers were on the fifth floor, which was scary. There was just a lot of technology that needed to be addressed from that team's perspective. And then also on the ops side, there was just so much more to do. The folks that were there were doing a great job, but it was bare bones, just trying to get things done and managed on the cash flow side. The investment team really has hovered over the years between 18 and 25. We expand a little bit now and then, but because of the analyst program and how it's designed, it's a two-year term. And at the end of the two years, that's when a decision is made. Do you want to move on or do you want to do something different? So some analysts go on to grad school, some move. So it's a lot of different reasons that folks turn over, but then some stay. So that's why it has a healthy turnover. And what does that look like today? The ops team. We are up 12 and hiring one, so we'll be at 13 in total. The tech team is completely transformed as well. Was lucky enough to get a director of IT who actually was in the admissions department and was interested in doing more investment technology. He joined us. He hired a desktop person and then for the first time hired two of our interns actually this past year. So that was a big change. And there's been huge changes on the technology front as it relates to our internal operations as well. Still a fairly lean organization. Yeah, when people hear how much we manage and then how many of the staff we have, they're always surprised. In your role, you have a large surface area to cover. How do you stay up to speed on all those moving parts? 
the culture honestly is helpful with that because we are super collaborative. Even in this swing space, we're open floor plan. We have offices that folks can duck out into, but generally speaking, everyone is on the open floor. Overhearing conversations is a big part of our learning and culture. Someone hearing something and then interrupting or butting in is actually what we want people to do. It's purposeful. And that was part of the negative aspects of COVID from our viewpoint, among many other negative aspects, was the fact that we didn't have that overhearing. We didn't have that, oh, wait a second, John and Andy are talking about this hedge that they're going to put on. Operationally, I need to understand how we're going to do that. So I'll just scooch my chair over and sit there and listen so that I know what the plan is. And I think that happens really frequently. I think having our teams be so integrated together is really our secret sauce. That was very important to Andy. He didn't want this operations team or tech team developing technology that, are we sure we want to use it? Is the investment team you know, up to speed on this? It had to be all bought in. So everything that we did from operations to technology to investments is integrated and understands what each other does. And so that's part of how I know what's going on is because we're all talking to each other. It's not like I have to get caught up. We have team meetings. So we have Monday meetings and Friday meetings. And the fact that everyone is invited to those is really important. And also so they can answer the questions. Sometimes the ops team has this information at their fingertips when things come up during those investment discussions. So I do think it's communication and collaboration that helps me stay on top of things. Once COVID subsided, did you have to work at keeping that collaboration and tacit information flow at the same level that it used to be? Folks got so used to being remote and communicating via chat. What people didn't realize is that that was a necessity. We were forced into that communication and that type of structure, whereas we worked so hard before COVID to make sure that our communication was open. Sure, Microsoft Chat helped us a ton in terms of being able to talk to someone as if they were next to you, but it still wasn't the same. I think the hardest part is that we do have a very young team and a lot of these junior folks hadn't had the experience yet to fully appreciate how much you learn by just being next to someone and overhearing conversations, overhearing a reference call. I think that that has taken time. I think we're getting there, but I do think that has taken time to rebuild that appreciation for the in-person. Given the amount of things that you personally touch, what does Jen own and what does Jen delegate? I implemented the first document management. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so having a director of IT was a huge delegation for me because that's what he went to school for. I was an econ major. I knew what I needed and I knew how things should work, but he's the expert. Having people like that is so important to be able to lead my group in terms of you want really smart people around you. And so that's what I try to do. If he's an expert in that, I want him to do that. And if she's an expert in that, I want her to do that that is pretty key to my success has been having those people who work with me be so great at what they do, to be honest. That has allowed me to delegate a lot. I probably still do more than I should, but I think I'm getting better. Andy has a little plaque on his monitor that says, who else should be doing this? And I always think of that when I am doing something. <laughs> is it harder because you're at a smaller organization? When I first started here, I... I think it might have been my first week. And I'm sitting, Andy is only a chair away from me and I'm working on my computer. And he's like, ah, oh, that printer back there isn't working. And I look at him and I'm like, yeah, and then I just keep typing. And I feel him still looking at me. It's like, oh, you mean me? <laughs> because he would have done it before. So that's how hands on we all have been. Again, if you think of something that's very entrepreneurial, like a startup or anything, you're doing everything. Everyone has had their hands in everything, but there does get a point in the growth of the team 
and the organization in terms of its maturity that for you to be better at what you do, you need to have the people to actually delegate that too. And on improvement, what do you do to actually try to move the needle a little bit ahead? Stretching myself to do things that make me uncomfortable like this. I sit on an external board. I think about our board and how helpful they have been and can be. And I just think about that for other organizations. And I just maybe want to train that muscle. There's also conferences that I attend on Industry Matters, AIMA, ILPA has them, things like that. But also, I find really helpful every year we have our Ops Peer Conference. And I think sharing our ideas and how people do things differently is also a way that might trigger us doing something different. What does that peer group look like? It's about 11 of the biggest endowments. And it's all of the people that hold positions like me. And basically, we have a day where we just talk about what are the five most important things going on in your organization. Each school hosts this, by the way. The host school will have maybe their auditor come in and talk about hot topics and things to be focused in on. And then they'll also have whatever is like AI. They had a few vendors come in and talk about what they do in terms of offering that software. I find it's the side conversations you have with people about the risks that they're seeing or organizational challenges and just hearing how they're thinking through that, I have always found helpful. Or quite frankly, reinforcing that I like the way we're doing it. And it can be that push and pull for reaffirmation. And what type of organizational challenges or what's an example of that, that people struggle with? Just people wanting to be remote more, but most of the senior people want people in the office and it's that whole thing. I think junior staff members, what they don't appreciate is that, yes, you've been productive, but do you want to catapult your career? Do you want to learn as much as possible? Do you want to be the best XYZ ever? That is going to require you to have some in-person <laughs> interface. I think that there's that lack of appreciation, I think, so that some people are seeing they've been challenged by. Do you think we'll land at a norm given the ongoing debate, which tends to be a binary view? I think certain fields will get back to what it used to be. I don't think everyone's going to now be hybrid. I don't think the new norm is remote work as much as it is now. Andy always does this to me. If you were going to make a bet that in five years, it would be more or less remote, what would you pick? And I'd say less. Will there be none? I don't know. But I would take the other side. Could you talk a little bit more about the board and the other stakeholders that you interact with? The board relationship is amazing. So one of the great parts of the governance is that the Prinko board doesn't approve investments. Prinko has the ability to invest without constraint as it relates to the board. And I think we report to the board, they know everything that we're doing and can obviously raise concerns, but there's no severe set approval process. And I think in that regard, they're able to be so super helpful to us in ways that you might see other boards, maybe not so much. A great example, I wasn't here to experience it, but I saw the results of it, was how during the financial crisis, the board the university, Andy, and Prinko all work together to figure out holistically what is best for the university. It's not great for the endowment to liquidate investments that are at their low. That's not what you want to liquidate. And it might be great for the university to take out debt at this point so that we don't have to do that. That collaboration is super important. Also, another living example is just how we look at liquidity in general. Jim Mateo, who is our VPF, sits on the board and the chairman of the Trustees Committee on Finance. So you have all of this integration already in our board. They really work well together to figure out the best liquidity posture for the university in general. In the end, what do we have together and what is optimal for the university? Is there an investment committee within the board? No. The way 
we process information is that we prinko. We make the decisions on the investments. So we do diligence, those meetings on Mondays and Fridays. We bring the entire team along on diligence. So there's certain people that would be on a deal team and will work specifically on certain manager relationships. They bring all the diligence along, discuss the pros, cons, and what we call a bull bear. These are bull bear arguments that we come up with in the beginning, and then we modify as we go, and then also provide mitigants to the extent that if they're a bear point, we'll have a mitigant or not. The culmination of all of that work comes to a bull bear decision meeting, and that is just the Prinko team, and we all vote. So we have this voting dynamic, like two right, pound the table, two left, negative, or one and one. You have to vote, though. You can't abstain. And we always say everyone votes. Not all votes are treated equally, <laughs> but everyone votes. And actually, Andy always withholds his vote. So he waits for everyone to give their honest view before he does. Although if you can read the room, you probably know <laughs> which way he's leaning. And the bear angle is really play the contrarian. Exactly. Not only do we have the bull bear arguments, we have a bull and a bear. And the entire team asks questions as it relates to that bull bear argument. So the bull will lead off with the key bull points, and then people will ask questions. And then the bear will lead off on the key bear points, and then everyone will ask questions. And how does the operations team fit into that equation? So we conduct ops DD, I would say, obviously, but not everyone does it. And that is actually part and parcel when I was talking about Andy his vision and the focus, as well as my vision, being an integrated team. The integration actually starts with the investment diligence as well as the operational diligence. We talked a little bit about the internal operations of Prinko, but there's also the external facing, which would be the folks who are the same people <laughs> also conduct the operational diligence on our managers. And part of the bull bear is the operational due diligence. So we do our own pluses and minuses Let's say it's a merging manager that doesn't have everything set up yet for infrastructure. We will list the risks, but we'll talk about what we can do to mitigate and how we see in terms of the people that we do interact with, what their views are on infrastructure. Is it a high significance, a high value aspect of their business? Do they understand it? Do they know who they need to put in place to actually get the job done. And so that is all discussed as well within that bull bear discussion. And the investment team typically participates in the operational due diligence as well. And I actually sit in on the investment diligence for our managers. So I can get an appreciation and others can too as to the strategy and then what you need to support that strategy. What is the role of the investment person when they sit in on the ODD session? They're open to ask questions or probe as we would, but the real value we see there is this idea of everyone understanding the flow of the dollar. So Andy often talks about the dollar leaving, who touches it, what happens to it, and how does it come back to you? In order to be a great investor, you have to understand every aspect of what happens to that dollar. It's another reason why we actually do not have internal legal counsel. We use external only. And the reason for that is that the investment person, as well as the ops team, has to play quarterback. You do use external legal counsel for expertise, but you own it. You have to understand the business, the economics, and what the risks are. And when you do hand it to legal, do you guys have key elements that you like to see? There are typical things that we usually push on. And we have been with this firm since I think Andy has been here. So they are super familiar with us. We're very familiar with them. We know when they're being conservative. They know when we're pushing on something. We just understand what the end goal is for each other. It's a really healthy way to have legal counsel and expertise. Where does the university fit into this whole equation? We have the board of directors. They also sit on trustees. So there is that automatic link with trustees, and there are actually trustees as well that sit on the Prinko board. 
And so that interaction happens naturally. They are aware of what we do and how we do things. We often describe our diligence processes as part of our regular board reporting. We do have status reports where we talk about managers we've met. What are we thinking of them? What do we think are some of the key risks? What we think we will do in the future? They also do get our investment memos, which will describe all the reasons why we want to invest with them. And then in terms of if you're going back to legal stuff, I personally deal with the OGC quite frequently. So if there's anything that comes up with a manager that we feel could have risk as it relates to the university, maybe in terms of reputation or, hey, this could pose an issue, let's talk about it. And also, Andy sits on the cabinet, so has interactions with general counsel. HR, we deal with them. I think I deal with them daily with everything that we do because we don't really have an internal HR. So I serve as that, but I leverage the university's HR for a lot of things that I need HR expertise on. Having activated that muscle for a little while now, any tips for people who inherit HR, but maybe have never played that role? I would say it's very helpful if you do have an HR department to leverage on, but you really do need to have certain expertise, particularly as you delve into new areas that have so much dimension to them, like diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's really important that you have experts that can help you work through what are best practices? What is the best way to get an organization culturally set up for success as it relates to their DNI? Having experts to lean on, knowing what you don't know, has it evolved into more of a legal area over time? I think there's always a little legal aspect to employment. <laughs> it's been more just organizational dynamics is what we spend a lot of our time on. You touched on it earlier, but just would love to hear a little bit more about the integration and collaboration with the investment team itself. We started very small in ops, so there were only two, and I would say those folks were really just keeping the engine going. And really what we wanted was to be a team that could leverage the investment team, not just keep the lights on. I had a vision as to the people and the skills I wanted on that team. I was very lucky in the people that I actually found and we actually have on the team now. What they have done is built true confidence. They understand the managers and the data better than anyone. They just really know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis with managers. Where we've leveraged the investment staff the most has been in that regard. So when investment team sees something or they're on an investment call, they had a reference call and they hear something, they'll often go to the ops team and say, hey, they were talking about guarantees on debt with XYZ. I didn't know that. Did you see that in the financials? The ops person who covers that manager, I can guarantee, knows off the top of their heads or can find it very quickly. We also serve as what we call an auxiliary investment team. It's not a secret, but we had built up our private equity portfolio pretty significantly prior to the global financial crisis. Then that happened. And then there was a realization that we had this thing called FBS, fewer, better, stronger. So we were pulling that portfolio down a bit and anyone that got into it had to be amazing. We still had a lot of managers on our books that had market value, but that we weren't re-upping with their next fund. And so because the operations team understood, dealt with these managers so frequently, they are actually the people who are attending the AGMs or the advisory board calls for those managers, making sure that any risks that arise or any issues are brought to the investment team right away. We call it paths to exit. They'll also keep documenting, this is the path to exit. Two portfolio companies left looking good and we'll give all the data as it relates to those. But that's an important component that the ops team has served that has really provided a significant amount of leverage for the investment team. Is that unusual or atypical compared to, let's say, your peer group? 
Yeah, I've not heard anyone do that. The other thing that was critical, and this was part of our technology and automation, but also critical in terms of what is the golden source of data, was getting to a golden source of data. And this could have only been executed through the investment team's trust of the operations team, because if they didn't, they wouldn't have felt comfortable with where we were going with this, and which was the ops team is the only team that can edit or put in data into our systems. No one else can touch it. And so that was huge because then I could control it. <laughs> Your audit hat is shining. <laughs> exactly. They just made sure the data was very good. So that is the source that we got the investment team to use. And that's what we use now. That has been a leverage for that team. I'd love to hear more about the tech piece about manager data. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Many folks might still be in the Excel <laughs> world where you use Excel as a database, but Excel is actually a calculation engine. It's not supposed to be a database. I also have this aversion to what they call end user developed applications because it's very dependent on the end user or someone who created these files. And I'm very much a proponent of being able to pick something up and do it yourself or really understand what's behind it. If you can't do that, then it's probably not good. And then also, if someone can break it pretty easily, it's probably not good. Which, by the way, was what we were working in. We were, had a ton of end user developed applications, all these files with different sources of data. And we were still able to get things done, but it just wasn't the excellence that I wanted to achieve for us. It actually took us a while to find too, because we really wanted something specific. We wanted something that actually could hold our entire portfolio. And a lot of these applications as they existed, were either grown from private investments or grown from a marketable and they came from the GP side. So they were a hedge fund application that then the LPs started using or a private investments or private equity application that the LP started using. But there was no one thing that did it all. And I think the idea was that people could run two systems, but we really wanted one. And so we found these folks that I believe it was Investor that they came from. It was Solovis that was the software that they created. And it was the first time we heard someone who understood what we wanted to do because they were allocators themselves. It was a risk because they were a startup, but we thought, hey, if they can work with us to develop this software to something that we want it to be, this might in the end be a win-win. And so that was one of our major accomplishments in terms of Solovis. Another one was just in the beginning stages was document management. That was probably when I started everyone's strongest pain point was our shared drive, which we call the F drive was no one could find anything. No one knew where anything was and it wasn't working. So we implemented document management system as well. Those two things really helped the process and then the market data tools we were able to implement and things like that. This all just kept elevating the analysis, which is my vision. The investment team should be doing analysis. They shouldn't be afraid that row 223 got cut and messed up their spreadsheet. Now that's what they're doing. They're doing much more analysis and then digging into the data in ways that then come back to us and say, really want to see it this way. Is there any way we can cut the data or create some report that does it? There are a lot more value add activities going on than before. And I can't even get into also just the nitty gritty of technology, security network, things that were just cleaned up by the tech team and just made us a much more, I'll call it adult organization as it relates to ensuring that we're secure and the network is what we want it to be. How does that portfolio management system run when you have mostly external managers? How does that data actually make its way into the system? That's all the operations team. So we have a process. There's all cash flows, market values, everything is run through their ops team that maker checker or 4i principle, someone enters, some are reviews, and we're ready to go. And so that's the process that we go through. We do have a custodian, which is technically our books and records, but 
it's really at the shadow book because we enter all the data into our system and then we feed that to our custodian. And so they're just double checking really that performance and flows are the same as what we have, but really we gave it to them. So it would be weird that it wouldn't be unless they had issues with some of the data. That was the golden source idea, just having a few individuals who understood the idea of 4 principle, attention to detail, knew when to raise their hand when certain things didn't make sense, like market values. And we read every single financial statement. So these folks are doing a ton of what I call desktop diligence that feeds into how the data makes it into our systems. In, in order to identify, you look at a number and say, oh, that's wrong. How important is it to actually know the manager in question? Very. Not everyone in the operations team knows every single manager. We have folks focused on real assets. We have folks focused on venture. We have folks focused on the marketable side. So there's a subset of the portfolio that they are focused on. So you know who to go to when you have a question on a certain manager. So they have in their head ideas. They also see all of the activity that is happening with that manager. So if it's a private equity manager, you just got 331 market values. It's 100 million. They just sold some investment and you get it. And that 100 million doesn't make sense anymore. And yet they're still reporting that, say, for 630. That's when you're like, I know they sold XYZ portfolio company. This doesn't make sense. Let me go back and look at the unaudited financials and see what's going on. Having that knowledge is important. And that is what I had mentioned is how we can leverage the investment team. Because the investment team will also see things. That interaction of data, it's something actually that I like to see with some of our managers particularly on the private side, when you have the investment team sitting on the boards of companies and getting information, I think it's a best practice and a very cool thing if the CFO of the private equity gets the data in a different way, because then when they meet, they should be speaking the same language. And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes the CFO will get different information that the board got. And that's when issues can bubble up and get resolved. Using that example in terms of what we do, the investment team will hear certain things from the managers, they'll come back to us, and then we can actually triangulate the data and figure out what might be going on here or what looks off. Adoption of technologies is difficult. How are you able to get people to adopt to new technology? For this particular one, I was coming at it as automating that particular spreadsheet. I had an aha moment where I said, no, we're not going to automate that. I'm going to automate what feeds that. And then they'll see how good that works. And then this will just be an output. So that's what I did. <laughs> and it literally was an aha moment. So all of the cash flow information, I basically was like, let's automate or adopt this new technology for that component. And I knew that the performance actually would kick out of that. But they didn't need to know that per se right away. I just needed to show them how well this first automation went in adopting this technology and how efficient and effective it made us. And that it just was great. We then introduced, oh, and look, we can actually do our performance calculations from this data. Amazing. Sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> But then people started realizing, yeah, that actually is helpful. So that's how we got there. And not only do you have to have a sense of urgency, but you have to have milestones along the way where you've proven the worth of what it is you're doing. And you have to be able to do that. One of the first things that I did when I came here was force the analysts to document. There was no documentation for anything. I forced them to document the benchmarking. So if you saw our benchmarking, you'd understand why. But basically, one of the analysts who is now an MD, I sat down with her and I said, describe the decision tree on this process. It took her two to three hours to describe the decision tree on all of the benchmarks that we use. 
And I was like, can you now write that down? She was very mad at me. <laughs> I still have the email. It's the document that we use to train staff as to how our benchmarks work. That was actually a huge undertaking to show them that putting in that work to document something is actually going to help years of people learn the process. So there's little wins that can basically add up and then people start seeing, oh, actually, this is an overall improvement for us. This is an overall value add. And I think you just have to keep adding to that list. What are the skills that you look for if you're trying to fill an operations role at Printco? Not everyone came from public accounting. Most did. So someone who has some experience in public accounting, it might be a horrible association, but I think of private equity firms that take their analysts from investment banks because they have learned certain things that it's just done. <laughs> They've learned how to do a valuation model. I don't have to teach them. It's less about that. And it's more about they've learned how to work really hard and they've learned attention to detail. You cannot work in the big four if you don't have an attention to detail. You can, you're not going to be very good. <laughs> we want the good one. Not afraid of huge volumes of data. That is also something you get exposure to in public accounting. You just said my auditor hat was glowing. Just having an audit mindset, trust but verify. Just having the internal control. You learn that in a very systematic way, in a fundamental way, when you come from public accounting. And I just know that they have that. Then all I test for is how they communicate and how I might see their future here. Are they wedded to this mission, which is super important to everyone that works here? So we can test for those things. Also, how they can read financials. It's important that folks know how to read financials and know what to look for in footnotes. Have you found anything from reading the footnotes that was not obvious to people? Yeah, you'll find litigation that might come up. You'll find debt that you might not see. You will find other entity structures that you might not have been aware of. We do see when we review valuation policies and procedures, we find different things. But I would say from the footnotes perspective, debt litigation and entity and or related party, that's where you see those things. And is that an operational function? We do read every single financial and we do call out those types of items into files and systems so that it is available. But we come at it at different ways. The investment team also does a debt survey every single year with our managers. So those two things should match up. It should be no surprise on either side. What do you mean by debt survey? We go out to our managers and basically ask what debt they hold. Is it at the fund level, the portfolio company level, what maturities are? Because you don't necessarily get all that data. And so we pull that together just to see what the debt market is like and what if we see any industry risk or maturity. Everyone's maturities are up now and interest rates are skyrocketing. So is there going to be trouble rolling or getting more debt? Things like that. Are there any other surveys that you do? We do a diversity survey. We actually just shared this with our peers at the Ops DD conference recently. We modified it to actually really gauge not only where managers stand in terms of their diversity, but also what we call the faucet because that's where we feel the biggest impact's going to be. It's going to be hard to change the bathwater, but if you change the faucet, it'll ultimately reveal itself. We focus on attitude, efforts, and results. That's how we think about things as it relates to diversity. And there's also a huge qualitative part to their diversity, as well as a very partnership-focused. So we didn't just send out an email here you go, please fill it out. We have done that in the past, but we felt like that was not helpful. So what we did is we actually reached out to managers, said, hey, this is coming your way. This is why we're doing it. This is what you're going to see that's different. Let's talk about it once you look through it. And that was the investment team actually doing all of that work. 
So that was a huge effort on their part. But managers actually really appreciated some of the feedback was that they appreciated that it wasn't, and this is no offense to HR, some HR person calling them saying, hey, do this. It was the person that they deal with constantly on the investment side. They really appreciated those interactions. Hopefully will result in results as it relates to diversity, but also resulted in some really great ideas being shared, meeting with certain managers that are embarking on some uncharted territory as it relates to trying to improve their diversity, maybe in really smaller fields. What's your view on that data coming out of those managers? There's definitely been a mindset change over the past few years that this is not a survey done once a year. Everyone's going to be asking you this, which means you need to do something about it if there are issues. Many managers have really taken it seriously in that they are trying to really think of different ways to change how they do things, be it people who never had interns. If you're a five-person shop, which some of our managers are, you never thought to have an intern, but they'll have an intern. And it might not be to convert to a full-time employment. It might just be to educate someone who might not have had the opportunity to work in a firm like that, that they can actually do investing or be in finance. And Prinko has a fairly robust intern program. Yeah. So we basically recruit primarily from Princeton University, but also have programs at Howard and MLT. Every single summer, we have summer analysts who work with us, who by the end of the summer, we either send an offer or not. And those are usually the individuals that will start with us the following summer as full-time. Before, we might have two interns, maybe convert one to a full-time and then have to go out and maybe hire again. Whereas now we're the four to six interns and then having four to five offers for the following year. It's been a hugely successful program. They have a ton of training. So they started June 5th. Even before June 5th, they actually get assignments to read a lot of CFA material, because we recruit from all backgrounds. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to be an Orphe major. You don't have to be an econ major. You can be a religion major. We assume that coming in, folks might not have the same quantitative background. And so we provide them with the materials to help them get on the same footing once they start the internship. So they'll do that work. We offer office hours with our current analysts so that they can talk through any of the issues that they have before they start. Then they start and then they have a whole host of training. They're still doing training and it's June 14th. So we will do intro to finance. We will do intro to marketable managers. We'll do private investments, ops, and technology. We pretty much run a whole host of trainings for them so that they really feel like they understand what is needed. This is reinforced throughout the summer but just so that they have an idea of what it is that they're hearing. And then they are treated, to be honest, as full-time employees. We don't give them any special projects. They do have a capstone project, but in terms of what they're working on, they're working on actual diligence projects. They're traveling to managers. So they're just treated as part of the team right off the bat. And I think that's a unique experience for them that a lot of their friends doing other internships actually don't get. Talk about sitting on the open floor. You're an intern, you sit two steps from Andy. That's pretty remarkable and unique, and you probably don't get that in an investment bank. Anything on the soft skills? We talk about what it is to work, how you should pack when you travel, carry on only, how to communicate, meaning how to update someone on your work. And if you're having trouble with something, should you spin your wheels? Should you ask questions? If you ask questions, what kind of questions should you ask? Who should you ask? We always say reach up rather than down because we want them to be asking the senior people what they should be doing so that they get that quick burst of information and not this, well, I think I heard you should be doing this. They're all assigned mentors. It runs the gamut. But yes, we do have that specific training as well. Looking back at the portfolio, you're mostly managers. Do you do any trading in-house? Yes. So we have a derivative portfolio. That's mainly the trading that we do in addition to trading in-kind distributions that we get. 
And we have a whole process behind that as well. So on the in kinds, it's fairly simple. A manager distributes a public company securities to us. We then have the view in nine out of 10 cases that we typically sell pretty quickly. And then on the derivative side, there's a team. It's mostly the senior team, as well as a few folks on the marketable side, as well as Andy, who sit and basically manage that derivative book. So what they're hedging, how they're hedging, what the market's doing, et cetera. And so they will basically trade that with our counterparties. And we also have within operations, one or two individuals who are specifically dedicated to trade operations. So we are moving margin and validating settlement and calculations and so forth within that team as well. So back in 2021, you had a 47% gain. Did that impact the organization at all with that big of a movement in terms of liquidity or other factors? Well, it was great. It impacted us because it changed the way we think about future commitments because the portfolio had grown so large. So that will impact that. But in terms of how we ran things or covered certain managers, that aspect did not change. Where I think the most change happened or will be happening because it can't happen right away is with the university it's probably goes to the collaboration with the university and that now you have a huge endowment and we have always professed the idea of intergenerational equity so you should be spending in a way that promotes that idea so the university is undergoing capital projects the entire i think footprint of the university is under construction. If you look at our websites and so forth, they're truly trying to change access to education. And part of that is growing. They changed the threshold for financial aid. Over 60% of our students are on financial aid, which is no loan. And then also the endowment provides over 65% of the budget because you can only do so much on a campus. And you can appreciate that if you're on it now that there's a lot going on. I do think that that perhaps did change in terms of how the university's vision will happen over the next few or many years. With the changes going on, is there anything at Prinko that you guys are taking on as a operational project enhancement? I'm going to use it loosely because I'm not convinced it's AI the way they're promoting it, but there are certain automations of reading data that can be used by the ops team. We'll call it AI, but using AI to read K1s, using AI to read capital calls, but more for data capture than it is for anyone to do an activity on it. It's more things that get manually entered. I'm seeing some possibility to automate that. I wanted to turn to managing CIO expectations. Any advice on somebody sitting in the seat like yourself and trying to manage somebody who doesn't have that operational lens? That's hard because Andy did all of this. So he has it. If someone didn't, I would say that having all your facts, I can go back to when I was trying to influence Andy and the senior team to automate what they really held as this Excel spreadsheet of performance. Everyone loved this thing, loved it. And I was like, I really don't think this is sustainable. We really should have a system. I can ensure that we know the nuts and bolts. It isn't going to be a black box. That's something that Andy and I have worked through and that my appreciation for the balance of efficiency and effectiveness. And when I say balance, I mean what I think Andy's balance is, meaning it is okay to be inefficient sometimes if you are more effective in the learning process. So we have huge meetings. One might say that would be much more efficient if there was just five of us, we'd probably come to the same decision, be done with it. However, you're not teaching anyone. No one is seeing how, as Andy says, the sausage gets made. So That is a really important inefficiency that we hold dear. And there was a lot of pushback on automating because people learn. If you had to manually figure out how all these calculations worked 
and how it worked through these a gazillion spreadsheets, you had to do this file. And I had to convince them that we could teach people the important aspects of what this learning was without having them scared to death that they were going to break this file, which every analyst was up until this point. So that took some convincing. And I think what one needs to do is actually make your case. Also highlight the sense of urgency. Why is this important for us to do? And what could go wrong? And what are the risks? I want to turn to the advice of someone in the seat or looking to get into a similar role. What are your thoughts on that? I think it depends what stage the organization's in, but I think being patient, willing to listen, not having your own agenda, having an organization agenda, I think is super important. If I have people on my team that want my job, I'm doing a good job. I want people to want to be in the seat. I want them to be functioning at that level because then that means that I've done a good job. And so that's really important to me. I think you do have to be a good manager of people. They are what makes everything work here. So having the ability to motivate, influence, be direct, be honest, transparent. Definitely, I was also afraid that I wouldn't know answers to certain things and then came to realize that I don't have answers to certain things and that's okay. I think if you're someone who feels like you should always have the answer, it's probably not a good spot because this place is ever changing. There was just so much more to this role than I had ever dreamed. Jen, this has been really exciting and in-depth conversation. We have two questions I like to close with. And the first one is, what advice would you give an emerging manager from an operational perspective? Plan for zero plus five. Don't plan for today, plan for five years ahead because infrastructure needs are not going to decrease. They are going to increase. Also plot your organizations, what you think the framework needs to be. I would say rely on trusted advisors. Do not try to do everything yourself. If you need to outsource, outsource, and then you can change that as needed. Also partner with helpful LPs. We always say to emerging managers that we engage with, and we don't hire all of them, and we will actually offer this advice. We'll give them best practices. We want them to be good in the industry. We want them to be great partners, even if we don't partner with them. But if we do partner with them, that is our goal. If they're great, we're great. And so the idea is we want to mitigate infrastructure risks to zero because we are not compensated for that risk. So that's a really important thing. So that means that we work together with them. We do not have a checklist mentality. We do not give them a checklist. We don't give them a survey to do nothing. It's an agenda that we sit down and we talk through with them in terms of how they think about the growth of their firm. What kind of people do they want around them? What kind of skill sets? What are they thinking about what their risks are? What are going to be their challenges? maybe what they don't have experience in and where they are going to need to fill the gaps. We just talk through that with them so that they have an appreciation. Because sometimes we're talking to the PM. Sometimes they haven't even hired a CFO or a COO yet or a CCO even. We talk through that with them. And also don't build in-house. I always say buy the best of breed of something and work from that. But certainly rely, particularly as it relates to compliance, because I feel like compliance sometimes is that I got to do that, but I don't really want to do that. (laughs) But you have to do that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I always remind them of that fact. I would say it's mainly use us as a resource. We have a huge portfolio. We're happy to help you. We provide not only best practices, but we provide managers with vendors that we see across the portfolio that we think would be great for them, not only in the fund admin space, but in the technology space, particularly as it relates to security. We help them with their valuation policy. We'll actually help them write it if they want, because we see a gazillion of them. And so that's something. We've actually even helped with job specs and interviewing some people. So there are a few literally emerging market managers 
who were SEC registered. And so they wanted a sense as to what kind of caliber of person should sit in that seat. And so we helped them with that and they did get theirs. And then the last question is, what is the one industry resource you most commonly refer to people? I'm going to say ILPA just because it has everything that we want and ask for, and it's an easily digestible format for these managers. It helps them not only with their reporting, but also with how they arrange their data. Jen, thanks for the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.